Hey guys, Jason here with RWB NetSec, and today we're going to be going over the basics of DNS and how it works on the internet. So this video will prep us for some of the upcoming tutorials on DNS enumeration uh, using some of the tools in Kali Linux. So along with the basics of how DNS works, uh, we'll also take a look at some of the terms that you're going to come across when using these tools, uh, things such as zone transfers and brute forcing domain names. So let's go ahead and get started. So first off, what is DNS? Uh, DNS itself stands for Domain Name System. Uh, it's basically just a system that will map a human-friendly domain name to an IP address. So for example, when you go to your browser and you type in google.com, DNS is going to take that domain name, uh, get the IP address for it, and then hand that back over to your computer. And that's what your computer will use to make a direct connection to the uh, server hosting that domain. Um, so DNS for us makes it a lot easier to remember names like google.com rather than trying to remember an IP address for every site we wanted to go to. Uh, there are a lot of services on the internet that use DNS, uh, things such as email, FTP, and web browsing. So DNS is critical to the internet and uh, the functionality of being able to get your email and uh, get to other websites. So now let's take a quick look at how DNS works. So say one of your friends has just told you about this cool site that you've just got to check out. So you hop on your computer, open a browser, and you type in www.coolsite.com. Uh, the first thing that will happen is your browser is going to ask your operating system if it knows what the IP address is for that site. Uh, the operating system will reply with, I don't know what the IP is, so let me send this on out. Um, it's going to go first to your resolving server, which for most of us is going to be our local ISP. Um, the ISP server is going to check its local cache. Uh, it won't have the IP for that site, so the request will get sent up to the root servers at that point. Now, the root servers contain information for all of the top-level domains, so all of the .com servers, .net, .edu, .biz. Um, there are hundreds of TLDs available, and the root servers keep track of all those. So the root server will check its local cache, It'll say, I don't have the IP for that site, but I do know where the .com servers are. So at that point, the request gets sent up to the TLD servers, which will check uh, their local cache, and they'll say, I don't know what the IP is for that specific site, uh, but I do know where the authoritative server is for that domain. So the request will get sent over to the authoritative server, which will check its local zone file, uh, it'll say, yeah, I've got that domain right here, and here's the IP address for it. So at that point, the IP will get sent back to your computer. The operating system will give it to your web browser, and then your web browser will connect directly to the web server. So just as a quick side note, um, how do the TLD servers know where the authoritative servers for all those domains? So if you've ever registered a domain name like um, with a place like GoDaddy or, or some of the other ones out there, uh, you know that there's a lot of information they ask for. You have to put in your name, address, phone number, um, and also the IP addresses for your name servers for your domain. The registrars store all of that information. And that's basically how all the other computers on the internet know where to find your site, your domains. So now that we've looked at this, let's take a look at some of these uh, terms that we'll come across when uh, working with the tools in Kali. First one is going to be the zone transfer. Uh, so basically all of the name servers contain a zone file, which is basically just a text file that contains all the information for the particular domain. Um, it's going to have the name servers, the MX records for mail, C name records, which are aliases, um, A records, etc. Um, when you do a request for a zone transfer, you're actually asking that server for a copy of its uh, zone database. 
Um, if you can get that, uh, you'll be able to see a lot maybe of the internal network for that company. Uh, there may be systems listed there that they didn't necessarily mean for anyone else outside the company to see or be able to get to. Um, but it will add systems that you can put in your attack scope. Um, just remember that if you're doing a pen test and you come across uh, a server that allows zone transfers that gives you additional systems, make sure that you check with the company and that those systems are in your target scope before you actually try to attack them. Um, one thing to note is most servers nowadays are properly configured where they will not permit you to do a zone transfer. Uh, but just know that this is a viable attack vector and it is something that you need to check for, so don't leave it out of your testing. Next, you've got a reverse lookup, which is basically just the opposite of the normal forward lookup. So instead of doing a domain to IP mapping, a reverse lookup where you you've got an IP address and you're going to map that to an actual domain name. So when you do a reverse lookup, uh, you're actually looking at the pointer records which will be listed in the zone file. Next we've got domain brute force. So the tools will take a predefined word list. Uh, it basically it will start at the top of the list, work its way down to the bottom, it will ping each of the subdomains. Uh, so for example here we've got test.coolsite.com. If you get a response back and the IP for that subdomain is different from the IP of just coolsite.com then you know that that subdomain exists and that here's another way that you can find the systems where you can add to your attack scope. Next you've got DNS cache snooping which basically you're just sending a request into the server to see if a particular uh, domain or host li lives in the uh, server's cache. Uh, an attacker can use this to see which sites have been recently visited by the uh, users at that domain. So you may be able to see things like online banking sites that they've gone to or online email accounts. Um, it, it just introduces an another layer of attacks that you can use. Maybe you can use those sites that they visit as an attack vector back into the company. But again, please verify with the company you're doing a pen test for if, if those things are within scope. Uh, the last one here is zone walking. So with zone walking, this attack comes into play uh, if you come across a server that does not allow zone transfers you can use zone walking. Um, basically uh, you can use it to get all of the zone information and the way it works is uh, say you've got a server that's got DNSSEC enabled uh, and they've got NSEC configured on it. So NSEC itself takes the information in the zone file so let's just say for example all of the A records it sorts those in alphabetical order so when you do a request um, Say you, you do a request for loot.coolsite.com. The server may reply with uh, loot.coolsite.com doesn't exist and it'll, it'll give you a range. So it'll say there are no sites between ftp.coolsite.com and mail.coolsite.com. Well, even though you didn't get a response for the original domain that you uh, were asking about, the server has just told you that ftp.coolsite.com and mail.coolsite.com exist. So you can use this technique to basically walk through a domain and get, get the names of the other subdomains that they have configured. Um, in addition to those terms, uh, just a quick overview again of some of the servers that you will come across when working with DNS. Um, again, the root server sits at the top of the DNS tree and it contains the information for all of the top level domain servers. Uh, the top level domain servers will contain information for all of the registered domains and the authoritative servers that they are associated with. A resolving server 
basically acts as a middleman between the client and the requested resource. So when you make the request from your computer, the resolving server then is going to take care of sending that request out and end up at the other servers. Uh, the authoritative name server is the server that contains the actual domain and IP mappings for a specific domain. And it's called authoritative because it returns an authoritative response to DNS requests, meaning I know this domain and here is the IP address for it. So that makes it the authoritative server. So we obviously didn't cover everything about DNS in this video, but I hope you learned something about DNS as far as what it is and the process that takes place when you visit a website for the first time. Um, for lots more information, uh, please take a look at the, these links that I've provided, and I will put them in the uh, description below. Um, but these sites go into a lot more detail, um, listing all of the resource records that are available for DNS, how DNS is configured, etc. So take a look at these, and you know, like I said, there are lots and lots of websites out there that will contain more detailed information. Uh, just as a side note here. Uh, the last link listed the OpenDNS.com. Um, this service will allow you to use an alternative DNS server locally uh, instead of using your ISP's name server. So check them out if you get a chance. Uh, look and see how that works. Um, so again, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Um, again, thanks to everybody for watching, and I hope you guys have an awesome day. See ya.